Welcome, everyone. Um, we're, we'll get started now if the translators are good to go. And please feel free to continue introducing yourself in the chat. Um, but we will we will launch our showcase now. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the first Healthy Seniors Pilot Project Showcase. Bonjour à tous et bienvenue à la première vitrine du projet Pilote sur les aînés. Welcome, everyone, and to the Healthy Seniors Pilot Project Showcase. Je m'appelle Candice Pollack et je serai votre modératrice aujourd'hui. Uh, Candice Pollack, I'll be your moderator. I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that UNB stands on the unsurrendered and unceded traditional Wolastikwe land. The lands of Wabanaki people are recognized in a series of peace and friendship treaties to establish an ongoing relationship of peace, friendship, and mutual respect between equal nations. The river that runs by UNB is known as Wollastook, along which the Wollastookweg, the people of the beautiful and bountiful river, live. Wollastook is also called the St. John River. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land today. I'd also like to acknowledge that virtual participants are gathered on many sacred lands and traditional territories, so we encourage you to reflect on the land on which you're located and to consider your relationship to the land and to the people who are the traditional keepers of that land in a moment of silence. On vous encourage de participer dans notre session aujourd'hui. We encourage you to participate today in this session in the language of your choice. Simultaneous interpretation is available and you can access to it, selecting the language of your choice in the icon in the bottom of your screen. It looks like a, a, it is an icon for interpretation in both English and French. To, accept, to access a simultaneous interpretation, please click on the globe symbol at the bottom right of your Zoom screen and select the language of your choice. Now that we've covered how to access translation, let's get started with the showcase. The Healthy Seniors Pilot Project is a partnership between the Government of New Brunswick's Department of Social Development and the Department of Health, as well as the Public Health Agency of Canada. Today's session is hosted by the Monitoring, Evaluation, and Knowledge Transfer Unit, or MEC2, with the New Brunswick Institute for Research, Data, and Training, housed at the University of New Brunswick. Created in 2018, MEC2 is a partnership between NBIRDT and the Government of New Brunswick that was developed to support the evaluation and knowledge transfer components of HSPP. J'aimerais aussi vous partager quelques points I'd like to share with you some uh, notes on the um, management uh, about the management of this uh, meeting if you have a technical question please do not hesitate to select or ask your question on the chat box you can also follow the presentation with the documents that we shared with you previously, you will notice that your mics are on mute. This is to avoid interruptions and sounds during the meeting. You can communicate with the speakers and other participants by using the chat box to ask your questions or share your thoughts. We'll do our best to share those comments and questions with presenters during the Q&A sessions. Our team will also be sending out questions in the chat box to engage you all and, and to join in on the conversation. Please keep an eye out for these discussions and take the time to participate if you feel comfortable. Lastly, please note that this meeting will be recorded. You'll have access to the presentation slides along with other post-meeting materials, which will all be emailed to you after the showcase. We'll also be sending you an evaluation survey so you can tell MEC2 how they did today and share with us your insights for future showcases. Now that we've covered the housekeeping items, let's set the stage for today's showcase. In 2016 in New Brunswick, 22% of the population was 65 years or older. Statistics Canada data suggests that the proportion of individuals over the age of 65 is gonna to continue to rise in the coming years. As we age, New Brunswickers will face new challenges to living safely and independently at home and in their communities. Our overall health and mobility may decline from chronic illness or natural changes associated with aging. 
We may require support for activities of daily living that we used to be able to do on our own, like getting groceries, bathing, or preparing meals. Staying connected and engaged within our communities may become more difficult due to limited transportation or the accessibility components of our built environment. New Brunswick needs evidence-informed solutions to address these challenges and support our aging population to remain healthy and safe so that they can age in the place of their choosing. Et le projet pilote sur les aînés en santé modèle l'avenir du vieillissement. Our project is here to monitor the needs of the healthy seniors, the situation of the healthy seniors, to age in their homes, communities, and care facilities. Les projets du PPAS visent à relever les défis auxquels nos aînés sont HSPP projects are here to help our seniors with the different challenges related to their aging. HSPP began with a $75 million investment by the Public Health Agency of Canada in agreement with the government of New Brunswick. Its goal was to help lay the groundwork for the dissemination of evidence-based best practices to support healthy aging for New Brunswickers and older adults in the rest of Canada. Because of New Brunswick's high proportion of those over the age of 65, our province is an ideal environment in which to promote innovative approaches to supporting seniors and healthy aging. The pilot projects undertaken through HSPP will help us understand things like the impacts of aging on our population, the different challenges that women and men face as they age, and how we can support individual seniors to maintain independence and a healthy lifestyle. Through our showcase today, we hope to raise awareness and share some initial findings from these applied research projects that are currently happening across New Brunswick and the rest of Canada. At that, le PPAS a HSPP has invested in 39 projects in the community and the government. All projects have the objective of helping the aging population. There are five pillars of these projects. The first pillar is improvement, the improvement of the social environment and the built environment for the aging population. The second pillar is to increase the independence and to promote healthy habits. Third pillar is to use the community approaches for reducing the health needs. Fourth one is to use technology for health issues. And the fifth pillar is to create innovative approaches. We will follow these five pillars and two presenters will talk about different about different pro, um, needs for the aging population. Each presenter will present their, uh, their pillar and then you will be able to ask questions about the presentation. Service providers, seniors, researchers, funders, community members, and more. So we hope to have a robust conversation focusing on world-class research conducted right here in the province of New Brunswick. Remember, there are 13 minutes dedicated for audience questions after each focus area. Feel free to type your questions in the chat box located to the right here at any time, and our team will aim to address all questions during the Q&A periods. We also have a graphic recorder joining us for the showcase today. Rachel Dara will be capturing our discussions through visual artwork and will be giving us a sneak peek of what she's been up to during our first break. Her completed artwork will be sent out with the post event materials in the coming weeks. Maintenant que nous avons couvert l'ordre du jour, on va commencer avec. We have covered the agenda. We will start with our first presentation that analyzes the conception of spaces, the system, and infrastructures to help the elders to live in the healthiest way. This includes supportive communities buildings that are supportive to and uh, adapted to the aging population, the respect, the social inclusion, 
communications, information, and community services and health services. The HSPP includes several projects that have as their objective to support better the elderly to participate actively in the community. Madame Suzanne Dupuy Blanchard will present the first project. Please uh, have the floor, Susan. Thank you, Candice. Thank you to Mekhtu and uh, everyone for inviting me in this session. Project is titled Nursing Home Without Walls. And uh, as one of our uh, project collaborators uh, explained to us not too long ago, she said, Nursing Home Without Walls sees the possibilities when seniors see the barriers. And I think that uh, says a lot about our project. And that really speaks to what we are trying to do. Next slide. Nursing Home Without Walls has uh, the goal to try to ensure that older adults can age in place with access to appropriate supports. And by appropriate supports, we are really uh, focusing on access to information as well as services. We are also through Nursing Home Without Walls providing social health initiatives to counter social isolation and loneliness, which are uh, sometimes uh, priorities around aging in place and um, some challenges. Increase in knowledge on health related issues important to aging in place, for example, um, preventing falls and having health information that uh, is useful for staying healthy as well as empowering local communities to respond to the needs of aging, an aging population. And we're trying to do this by creating age-friendly communities. You'll see on the slide pictures from uh, some of our projects uh, that First Lady, it was an intergenerational project. And then we have an outing uh, with a minibus from uh, uh, one of the nursing homes in our project, as well as one lady uh, who needed repairs done to her uh, home to be able to age in place. Next slide. So what we are focusing on, um, this project aims it is aimed towards older adults over the age of 60 and their families in four rural New Brunswick communities. And these four rural communities, uh, the basis of the project is really uh, at the location of the nursing homes in these communities. So Port Elgin, Lamec, Inkerman and Packetville. So three communities that are uh, Francophone in the Acadian Peninsula and one that is English speaking in southeastern New Brunswick, but all four are rural communities. What we are doing there is um, we are basically in one of the locations uh, of the project in Port Elgin. We're mostly having an accompaniment to access services and coordinate continued support um, approach. So some will call it a navigator approach. Um, we're still debating if navigator is the appropriate term because what we are realizing with time is that there is a lot of accompaniment, um, that providing information is not sufficient, but that uh, there is continued support that is um, warranted. And of course, we're also focusing on some social health and some age-friendly communities approach. One of the quotes on the bottom uh, is for the accompaniment to access services. The services are available, but they are not accessible. Nursing home without walls makes them accessible. I can stay in my home. The other aspect of nursing home without walls is through nursing home in-house services and outreach to the community. And what I mean by that is that in uh, the Acadian Peninsula, we are focusing on having some uh, community older adults come into the nursing home for certain services and then come back, uh, go back to their homes. And there are workers in the nursing homes that are actually also going out to uh, seniors in the community. Um, this is with additional resources, I may add, and um, they're also focusing on social health and age-friendly community as well. Um, this is not necessarily an alternative to what's already in place, but I would say mostly com uh, complementary. So, um, you know, we would usually have traditional home support services that don't always uh, fit what is needed to stay at home. The 211 service that does provide information, but that does not necessarily uh, provide that accompaniment that we are doing. And uh, that would result in difficulty to access services and aging out of place.
The consequences of our project so far is that there's an increased access to services and therefore an ability to age in place and a delayed or prevented admission to long-term care or um, emerge visits. Uh, in one of the locations, we have participants saying that 65% of them answered that nursing home without walls prevented them from going uh, to the emergency department or prevented a crisis situation. We have so far a very high satisfaction with the services and the approach of nursing home without walls. And also um, the social health initiatives are really addressing social isolation. My last quote uh, is in French and uh, relates to the social health uh, initiative. Mes parents sont privilégiés de participer. My parents are privileged to participate in this project. This morning, we went with the minibus to paint near the sea. Otherwise, I would have stayed my parents at home. Thank you so much. We'll now go to the next presentation with Sharon McKenzie on the Intergenerational Action Plan. Hi, I'm Sharon McKenzie, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm lead in this project as well as um, executive director of I2I Intergenerational Society. The goal of our project is to reduce isolation and loneliness and improve the health of seniors. And the way that we're going about this is through intergenerational activities between seniors, youth, and children that are purposeful and respectful. We have um, done this through webinars right across the province, engaging people both in French and English. And during those webinars and training sessions, we give information about what is best intergenerational practice and um, how to go about doing it and why is it important. As well, we review three government funded, excellent, but very not well known whatsoever, um, three resources, two of them uh, across the generations and teen kit funded by Public Health Agency Canada during the initiative for elder abuse awareness. And one of them funded by New Brunswick government called Connecting Generations. And these are absolutely excellent, um, really excellent resources. And as I say, they're little known and they're available both in French and English at intergenerational.ca. Um, the third thing that we really work towards is June 1st, which is Intergenerational Day Canada. It's recognized in perpetuity by New Brunswick, as well as Ontario and Manitoba. And it is proclaimed annually by most of the provinces and territories, as well as over 100 cities in Canada. And we're having New Brunswick really lead the way in this. So on June 1st in 2021, we actually looked at um, what kinds of things were happening in New Brunswick already that were intergenerational and what things were happening on the day to celebrate and how were we Im impacting other people within the province in terms of interest. And I'd like to bring to your, I'd like a different slide if I could please, sorry. Forgot that I would say, yeah, one of the things I did want to say is one of the things we really focus on is that it's not about doing different things. You don't have to add on to your workload, but rather what the opportunity is there to take what you already do and do it differently. So you can see from this slide that there are children reading and there are seniors reading. So why not read the same book and then come together to discuss it? And now the last slide. Good. Thank you. Um, on June 1st, uh, Connaught School, Connaught Street School in um, Fredericton had five teachers that went out and found 100 seniors uh, and then got their addresses and they had 100 students who created artwork and letters to the seniors and mailed them out. This was an incredibly successful project during COVID. I mean, they, they had went, did this all through lockdown and everything else. And it was incredibly successful. And this year they have 20 teachers that are now involved in this. So hats off to that school. And we're hoping that that will be an icon for other schools within the province and even within Canada to, to take a part in. Um, we had four care homes, one in Hillsborough, two in St. John, and one in, in uh, Fredericton who connected with, uh, actually there's other, some French communities too. And I see my colleague Jean Bridot did not think she could attend today, but she maybe would like to speak to these during the question period. But these four centers in particular on the English side uh, connected with um, a youth orchestra and they came and performed in the parking lot of the school with the seniors watching from the, from the windows and the children spread out on the lawn. Many of these events actually went beyond that. And I know in St. John, the, the 
had one school that actually painted rocks and the, uh, the rocks were then laid all about on the walkways where the seniors would go so that they could remember, be reminded of the, the children coming. Um, Moncton City Council has a senior advisory council and a junior advisory council. And they had not really, they come together once in a while, but what we did was we connected four seniors from the advisory council and four teenagers from the youth council. And they created several months ago, uh, a conversation group on Zoom. And every Saturday night, they meet for an hour and have discussions. And it's quite interesting. They were very cautious about what topics they should discuss because they didn't want anyone to go away sad and they didn't want anything to be confrontational, but uh, they've become, they uh, now know each other so well that one of the young fellows was telling me the other day that he had um, mentioned he was going to buy sneakers for $160 and the seniors had quite a bit to say about that. So he said he got a really good lesson. Bathurst, um, Rosse, uh, St. Andrews and St. Stephen's all doing wonderful activities. And I know uh, Boktouche and several of the other French communities as well involved. And so these are small steps, but they make profound differences in senior health. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, for sharing that presentation with us. I'd like to ask you to keep your camera on and welcoming back Suzanne as well for our first Q&A session. Um, a reminder to participants that you can put your questions in the chat box. We'll do our best to get to, to each of them. I do have a first question to kick us off uh, for this panel. So the World Health Organization recently came out with a report that indicates that globally one in two people are ageist against older persons. Can you both share with us your thoughts on how our communities can combat ageism in the way that we construct our future social and built environments? I can start us off if you want. Uh, I don't. I didn't want to cut Sharon off. <laughs> um, I think actually Sharon's um, presentation or project uh, really touches upon this because I be, uh, one of the best uh, ways to address ageism is through intergenerational projects because uh, we start with a young generation that uh, will will grow to know what aging is about and uh, will hopefully change the construct of what aging. Uh, it, it's not a. It's not a negative thing, but a very positive uh, aspect. And uh, it actually fits right into the UN decade of healthy aging uh, for the next 10 years. Uh, ageism was identified as one of the priorities for the UN. And so I think we'll be hearing a lot more about that. In our project, we're actually um, looking at some intergenerational projects um, with local schools, as well as a local university um, to address the social health initiative in our project, but also looking at age-friendly communities and really trying to uh, come at it from a grassroots uh, approach. I think that ties in really nicely to Sharon's presentation. Do you want to answer that question as well, Sharon? Yeah, well, I, I would really like to because it's interesting because I'm involved with um, children most of the time. I, I find it's interesting that we think ageism really happens just from young people towards older people. But in fact, there's a lot of older people that are ageist towards younger people. So I think that intergenerational just collapses those two problems into one and creates a solution. So the minute that you have somebody who doesn't know somebody, if they don't have a name, if you don't know about them, and it takes so little to connect seniors and children. Children. It can be that they have a birthday in the same month. It can be that they both lost a tooth. It doesn't really matter. But the fact that they connect breaks down those attitudes and breaks. And, and one thing that I had mentioned to April yesterday that I think is really important. We hear a lot about how um, we need to have more helpers in these care facilities and more helpers in situations like Suzanne was talking about it in the home. But how are you going to convince young people to go on to take careers in taking care of older people if they think older people are boring and fall asleep and are smelly, et cetera? They, when they have that personal connection, and I had 10 years with the Meadow School Project in British Columbia where we moved our classroom into a care home for two and a half months. And in that time, those kids saw that these seniors were not seniors, they were their friends. And interestingly enough, I tracked them for 10 years and several of them had changed their career ambition from being a rock star or a marine biologist, which is very popular out in BC, to becoming care workers or LPNs or nurses. So I think there's a huge, such a huge benefit. I mean, yay for intergenerational. <laughs> 
Yeah, I agree, Sharon. Uh, if I can just jump in, we just completed another project actually in New Brunswick schools, and uh, we asked uh, uh, 10 and 11 graders uh, their perspective on aging and careers uh, in aging. And they said, we just don't talk about it in schools. And so why don't we have, uh, you know, connections with seniors or have uh, seniors come in and talk to us and whatnot. And uh, it's so important what you're saying, Sharon. Thank you. They really need to be building in that empathy component um, when we're talking about intergenerational intergenerational activities, right? That's that's the key goal of, of all of those is to get people to understand what it's like to live a day in somebody else's shoes. Um, I see here a question for Suzanne from Kate Ellis um, talking about the Nursing Homes Without Walls project. She says, this is such an innovative project. What do you think would be required to be able to continue this project long-term? And do you see it being feasible to scale it up across all of New Brunswick? Definitely on the scale up. Um, I have other nursing homes. There are four in the pilot project. Uh, I have worked with others in um, their legwork, I can say, and uh, actually uh, working with a few others right now that are trying to see the possibilities that they would have in their communities. They're all rural, so I think what is necessary is to have uh, a nursing home that's willing to embrace a larger role um, for them, and of course having the resources, but some of those resources could also be uh, volunteer resources, not all of it, and I will, I will add that because um, in working with other nursing homes, homes, I've realized that there are some things like reaching out to uh, like doing friendly visits or friendly calls and things like that, that can easily be done by volunteers, but some other things cannot. And so I think it's a balance of depending on what it is that uh, those communities want to implement. Um, but the benefit is that a lot of the people who are working in the local nursing home already know the community and know the, the older adults in the community and one who's been hospitalized and who's back and who needs support. And it's a real close network in uh, many of the rural communities I've seen here in New Brunswick. And there's been great interest in the notion of uh, working with nursing homes to provide aging in place support. And I would add not only in New Brunswick, but I have had interest from uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan and Ontario and many others. So the scalability of this is uh, is very exciting. Sharon, I think scalability is a challenge for any intervention that deals with the with the aging population and all of the promising practices that we're looking to cover under HSPP. Tell me, what do you think about the potential scalability of some of the intergenerational programs that you're seeing happening and, and how do we make sure that those get replicated in other communities? A fabulous question. And sometimes it puzzles me why all, all of Canada is not embracing this because it is so easy. First of all, we say make any activity, as I said earlier, one that's something that you're already doing and just see it through an intergenerational perspective. Uh, make it fun and make it simple because as soon as it gets to be difficult or costly, you're, you're not going to have people replicating it. You're not going to have anybody even sustaining it. They're going to say, oh, once was enough and that's it. So I think um, it's small steps. It's, it's just small steps. And I think Cannot School Street School is such an incredible example of starting out with one teacher that I, well, actually two teachers that I visited in New Brunswick uh, about a year and a half ago, they went to five staff members. Now they've got 20 members of their staff all on board and they probably would have had that part way through last year had it not been for COVID and the separation of staffs into their homes and so forth. But you know, we, if we could have all the schools in New Brunswick, contact them and see what they're doing. Hillsboro, uh, they're doing some wonderful things there with one of the elementary schools on an ongoing basis, but it's small steps. It doesn't have to be something big. So in terms of scalability, it's those little incremental shifts in how you look at what you do. So if you're gardening and seniors are, are gardening and, and have a community garden or putting bulbs in around their home or whatever, and children are doing it at school, why not bring them when we can together to do that together? So it's it's really about what how you view what you already do. And that's the message that we have to get out there. It's not hard. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It's lots of fun. And honestly, what makes it grow is that your heart it's like the Grinch who stole Christmas. Your heart just grows 10 sizes too big. Like you just can't stop because it's that addictive, having that wonderful fun. Thanks so much, Sharon. I see one more question in the chat uh, for you and, and we'll answer that question and then move on to our next 
domain for the um, showcase today. So Melissa, Melissa Blanchette is asking for your intergenerational groups, were the participants related or did they know each other prior to joining? Um, now, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite certain what how that goes. Some of the, the and if she's talking about coming to the webinars, in some cases, it was contacts that Jean Bridot and I had within the community. In some cases, like Connaught School, for example, it was a whole staff. In other cases, like the care homes, it was just individuals. Uh, we have a lot of people, especially in St. Andrews, St. Stephen's, where they're just community-based people, and they took it upon themselves during their fitness session or whatever to start talking to everybody about connecting with young people in their community. So uh, no, it was not necessarily. I know with Connaught Street School, I talked about them having a seniors that they sent uh, envelopes out to well some of those were grandparents and people that were connected or related to the kids but in all honesty they actually were asking people like their custodian do you have a mother who's living alone I got an envelope it was wonderful so a lot of they they spread that goodness out throughout the country that's lovely thank you so much Suzanne and Sharon for your time today and for your thank excellent you. presentations thank you very much thank you it was a pleasure Great, we're going to move on to the second domain now. Um, and this domain of the showcase focuses on increasing independence, quality of life, and promoting healthy lifestyles for older adults. Some of the applied research projects within this theme examine the provision and promotion of activities that deal with physical health, nutrition, injury prevention, and mental wellness, as well as programs aimed at training and supporting unpaid caregivers. Our next speakers, Anita Punamia and Danielle Bouchard, will share with us two projects that focus on arts and physical activity for older adults, respectively. I'll hand the floor over to Anita to tell us more about participatory or arts for older adults. Uh, Anita Panamia, I was a coordinator for this project. And uh, this project was a collaboration between Art for Life and UNB. The objective was to study the impact of participation in regular professionally led creative activities on the health and well being of older adults. This is a quote from one of our participants uh, in St. John. She's 80 years old. And uh, she felt that the year that we had all the activities has been, had provided a lot of soul food for her. Next slide, please. Our target population was adults 65 and up living independently in the greater St. John area with a frailty index equal to or less than five. We recruited about 252 participants and divided them into two groups, intervention and control group. Our intervention was a variety of creative activities, drawing, collage, painting, which included watercolor and acrylic, uh, clay work, soapstone sculpture, creative movement, and theater. The reason we offered a wide range of activities was uh, most people had done drawing or painting at some point in their lives, but they may have not tried any of the others. And we wanted them to experience things that may have been either out of reach or they may have never considered. All the activities were delivered by professional art educators trained to work with seniors. Uh, and they were all local. Each session was for three weeks, two hours per week. We delivered for a total of 43 weeks. Our intended uh, plan was for 48 weeks, but because of COVID, we had to stop a couple of times. All activities were delivered in four locations for the most part. Uh, through COVID at the later end, one of the locations closed down. So then we had moved those participants to the other three locations. Uh, what we were trying to understand was uh, what was the change in predetermined parameters in the intervention group over time after they attended all the activities and the change between the intervention and the control group. The reason we had taken a different module, all our activities was three weeks, because we didn't want people to get bored with something or if they dislike something, uh, to drop out of the program. So we said three weeks was enough to give them a taste of something and they could continue with whatever they liked more at later stages. We use mixed method, qualitative and quantitative studies. Uh, we had picked a range of questionnaires for the quantitative part 
And we did one-on-one -on -one interviews and focus groups for the qualitative. Next slide, please. Our outcomes, uh, data analysis is currently underway. So far, we have verbal validation and a qualitative analysis uh, shows that there has been positive impact uh, and it is in line with other research studies that have been done on similar uh, basis. The quantitative analysis is currently underway. We held an exhibition of all the artwork created, most of the artwork created during our program, the St. John Art Center at the mention. And we were just told by the director of the St. John Art Center that this exhibition brought in the maximum number of visitors to the art center over the last 10 years. A projected long-term benefits of the program uh, for the seniors themselves, it addresses social, social isolation and boredom for the artists, recognition of local talent and provide employment to them. For families of the seniors, value and pride in seniors activities and positive outcomes for all family members. At the exhibition, we heard over and over again how the seniors had gone to the exhibition themselves to check out what they had done, what their friends had done, then they took their children and the grandchildren and friends and how, how proud they were of what they had achieved. And for the community, the benefits are uh, to show that arts is a positive contributor to health. Thanks. Thanks so much, Anita. We'll hand it over to Danielle now to tell us a little bit about Zoomers for All. You see, it's all good. Yes, Danielle, we can see you. Okay, perfect. So important that you see me, you know. Uh, okay, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Danielle Bouchard. I'm an associate prof at UNB in the Faculty of Kinesiology. And I'll talk to you about Zoomers for All. Um, so I want to start off with some quotes because uh, the reason why we do what we do is to please somebody that is in the community and adding something that is important for them. So the first was, is about uh, finance. Uh, so so I'm, I'm at a part-time job that brought a little bit of money here and there, but this being free is key. So program, exercise program here is free. I work and raise a family and there wasn't much left uh, time over. Now I have th this program has brought me so um, out and it's so fun. So a lot of uh, people who are reporting the, the fact that they're now retired, get them some money, it's not money, but time, to, uh, to go out and do some exercise. Uh, the last one is my health is poor. I did not think I could follow. Having older leaders, uh, old leaders like me, made me feel understood. The program is offered uh, by other peers. So those are quotes that were brought to me in 2017 when I was uh, moving here by uh, people that put this program together. It's been alive since 2012. And uh, they asked me like if, if they should still invest in this program. And I said, yes, great. Um, what do you have about um, the outcome? And what are you trying to do? And they said, uh, reduce the risk of falls. And I said, well, do you measure falls? No, but people like it. It's okay, well, let's work together and, and identify if this program actually works. Um, second slide. So the program itself is a 12 week session that goes on and on during the year. It's offered by uh, people age 50 plus and also offered to people age 50 plus. So it's led by 50 plus and it's offered for 50 plus. Uh, it's online in person now uh, because of COVID. And I wanna say that we had a lot of challenges with COVID, but a lot of positive as well. Like I, I hear a lot of negative about COVID, but really uh, for this program, it was just a spark to think otherwise how we can deliver programs. It's now currently offered across the province. Uh, that was the goal of HSPP. And it was translated to French. So now it's available in both languages. Um, as you can see on the, the right slide, the right piece of the slide, uh, the map, uh, we have places in the province where we have participants, others uh, we have leaders, and most of the places we have leaders and participants. Why do we have black dots, no leaders? It's because of the online. So it got us the ability to go in, um, in some uh, remote communities where there's no leader. Uh, leaders are trained by Fitness New Brunswick and uh, we are in partnership with Trauma New Brunswick that bring us some financial um, abilities to make this sustainable. Um, so in 2019, we proved that there's short-term benefits and now like we want to implement the program. So now it's about 
how many people access, how many people participate and keep participating. Uh, we currently have 545 participants in the province and half of them are online. And the interesting part here is the fact that some of them want to be online. It's not about COVID, it's about practical, practicality of having an online possibility. Can we switch please? So we already found uh, some short-term improvement, which was published uh, last year. And uh, on all aspects, physical, psychological, and social outcomes. Um, everyone will, uh, it's easy to find that uh, they're going to be like short-term outcomes when you do exercise, not a surprise. However, uh, it's the long-term uh, that we're after right now. So because of the NBIRDT, and also because every person is asked to share the Medicare number, we are able to track uh, Zoomers participants versus non-Zoomers participants for many years. And because this program has started in 2012, uh, we are now nine years following these people. And what we're after is the risk of falls, uh, injury, surgery, uh, hip replacement, uh, number of hospitalization, number of physician visits, and we will have access eventually to the admission to nursing home. So at the end of the day, the goal is to show that this is a cost-effective program that should be implemented across province and um, has some uh, really true uh, financial impact. Uh, so uh, were to, to be um, funded. So that's the program. And uh, I want to say though, like finish by saying that I just pressed submit yesterday to a CIHR uh, pro, uh, funding to implement Zoomers on the go across uh, Canada with the same model uh, and uh, hopefully will be funded. That's great news, Danielle. Um, I'll keep you and Anita here for our next panel, which is starting now. And I have a question to get us started. I wanted to ask both of you, you've shared with us the important role that participatory arts and physical activity can play in improving individual health, well-being, and quality of life for older adults. But can you tell us a little bit more about any steps you might have taken in these projects to ensure accessibility for seniors who are living with physical or cognitive disabilities? I can start. Um, we had to have a, uh, an exclusion criteria for uh, seniors with disabilities uh, by having a frailty test. So we did have you know, some people who came with uh, walkers, so that was not a problem, mainly because the artists who conducted the program were not healthcare providers. And because all our sessions were in person, we did not want to have any uh, situation where if somebody was really frail, that our artists would not be able to uh, take care of that situation. Uh, on our side, uh, inclusion is really important. Um, especially in the remote communities. Uh, but it's, not, it's impossible to have a program that will be uh, inclusive of everyone that lives in the province. Um, however, when people have physical and cognitive um, issues, they can, they're welcome to the program if they have um, someone with them, could be a friend, could be a relative. Uh, and when the, with the online portion now, it's even more accessible for people that have some um, limitations. However, I wanna say that uh, our leaders are not um, trained to take care of like specific um, problems. And it's not only for cognitive and, and physical limitation, but also like health limitations. Uh, the way we see this in the program, if you can come from the parking lot to the program, you're in uh, and we can adapt. Um, but uh, inclusion, inclusion goes beyond, beyond cognitive and physical limitation. We are trying to have like people from different communities, we're trying to have like a male that are not really present in our pro program. So it's, it's inclusive of more than those two, but um, we're definitely uh, working towards having as many people able to uh, um, come in this program. Yeah, those intersectional lines are really important to consider um, as part of that broader approach, especially if you're looking to scale across Canada. Um, I see we have a couple of comments and questions here, a few people um mentioning someone who's uh becoming a zoomers leader in in the audience today um anita somebody has asked um what impact do you think the project will have at a systemic level um in terms of participatory arts so what we are looking at is uh, through the quantitative part understand 
uh, similar to the uh, similar to Danielle's project on the effect on the healthcare system. Did it prevent uh, use of uh, less usage of the healthcare system, less medication, less ER visits? Uh, again, so that is being studied right now. Uh, and that's why we think at the systemic level, if we can show that there is a greater benefit on the overall health of the participants, it helps the whole system. It helps the families, it helps the systems. And we are using assets that are actually even available in the communities like community centers. We used all the locations that our art activities were provided were in the communities. We use local artists. So by using assets that we have that exist in our community, we can be able to pro, uh, meet the needs of our growing senior demographics. Thanks, Anita. Um, Angela asks for both of you, are the Zoomers who teach the program and the art program teachers paid employees or is this a volunteer opportunity? Um, and how do, you, how do you go about kind of recruiting people? So all our artists were paid employees uh, and we recruited them. I interviewed a whole bunch of artists. Not all artists are uh, want to teach and not all our teachers are artists. So to find art educators uh, that were interested in teaching the senior population. Plus I had attended workshops in New York. Uh, so I was, I learned on the challenges to uh, teach seniors who may have visibility issues or hearing issues or arthritis in their hands. So provided a training to the artists before we started our program on the different kind of scenarios that they might meet and how do you mitigate those? So all the artists had attended uh, training sessions on working with seniors. On our and again, because we had a variety of, uh, wanted to offer a variety of projects. So found people who are skilled in a wider range of uh, our creative activities. Thank On you. our end, it's all volunteers. Uh, so all their expenses are covered obviously, but uh, the, the time that they spend in the community is uh, volunteer work. Uh, and, and I was skeptical when we started this project saying like, oh my gosh, like it's a lot of involvement. It's 32 hours of training uh, that they receive uh, by Fitness New Brunswick. And they have to have their CPR every year. And they, so it is quite involving. And I was like surprised, I mean, surprised, really surprised. We have 51 leaders right now in the province and we have 15 in training. So there's people that want to do this. And I think if we would pay them, it would not be the same group of people. It comes with challenge to have volunteers. We want to please them. We want to, uh, we want to, we want to keep them. And it, it comes with different challenge because the, the money is not there to motivate them. So someone, something else needs to be motivating them. So we do have a, an advisory committee that is composed of different stakeholders in the province. And some of them are older adults and they do help us to find what is worth it uh, for them to be involved at that level. And also we did, uh, I want to say 24 interviews with leaders to exactly uh, try to figure out what makes them stick around and what makes them want to do that so we can attract the right way, the next leaders in our program. That's so critical, um, asking those questions of your volunteers to understand what, what motivates them to stay at the table and how do you find people um, like them to be the leaders for your program. Um, I see a lot of questions in the chat about the impacts of COVID-19 and moving to a virtual format. Danielle, you mentioned that the online setting um, for Zoomers on the go actually was great for some people because it was more accessible in certain ways. But can you tell us a little bit more about how COVID-19 forced a, a shift in service delivery? And did you see a drop off or an increase in participants in the program? Yeah, and I will, uh, I see a lot of comments and, uh, and questions, I'll answer them afterwards. Um, so the online was uh, interesting. Uh, when we first thought, we said like, oh, we will lose a lot of people. What will happen with this program? And we shifted online. And I mean, I want to say that my staff did help these people a lot, but uh, I want to say like, I was surprisingly uh, happy to see that these people were ready to go online. And, and the biggest surprise is not that they needed to go online because they, they were forced to. The biggest surprise is that now that we can go back in person, they do require that we keep online portion. So, um, so that was a good surprise. It came with challenge, but I think 
life is all about challenges. It's how you actually address them. And I find that online be, uh, became like not a, a patch. We thought it was going to be a patch and now it's part of the, the program. And it, it opens up so many doors and um, we, all, we all have everything that exists. So the person that is not really familiar with um, the technology is now like meeting with the person that is in their bubble family to do the program. We have like community health centers that are not equipped with a leader, but are equipped with a technology. So we have like a group of people meeting in a room, but the leader is not in person, is online. So I, I can tell you about like 20 different ways you can actually be part of the program now. So it is opening up uh, more opportunities that that makes this like even more in, in interesting. And I do have graduate students looking into like all those uh, outcomes research wise, is it feasible to test somebody online? Is it feasible, do you have the same outcome when you do two times online and one time in person? I mean, we have eh, just work and fun uh, now with this project. Thanks, Danielle. Anita, how about on your end? How has um, the pandemic and physical distancing shifted the way your program is being delivered? Our program was delivered in person and we stayed in person. We checked with a large number of our participants and most of them wanted to come out and be with other people. They said, we don't want another screen. Uh, we have been, you know, that's all we are, uh, we can do these days, but if it's possible. So we had to submit operations plans and luckily our locations were such that, and our groups were small. We have the largest group size was not, uh, 10. We were able to keep them at social distancing, masking was mandatory, cleaning, you know, sanitizing everything that was done because we, some locations we had four sessions per day. Uh, the other thing is not all of our seniors were comfortable with online. Some people don't even have email addresses and doing an art program, uh, they didn't have the materials. They had never done sculpture before. How could we give them clay? You know, so th some some activities definitely did not uh, gear towards an online kind of thing because uh, just the nature of the activity. And again, as I said, most of them wanted to come in. We did have a dropout of a number of participants during COVID, especially seniors who had underlying health issues or family members with underlying health issues. So we did lose people during COVID, but uh, majority of the people came. And they came even throughout the winter. You know, we had snowstorms or whatever people were coming because they were like, this is the one thing we can attend. We don't want to stop. That's amazing. Um, we have one last question that we'll cover and I think probably more geared towards uh, Danielle since we just talked about shifting to virtual service delivery. Um, how have your leaders enabled older adults to use virtual options? Did you face challenges in getting people um, tech ready to participate in Zoomers online? Yeah, we had like, we have the two, right? So the, the leaders were, uh, they received like a continuous education session that they were in, invited to. And we did lose some leaders that were like, I'm not doing this. And what we did is we made them as a participant. So like, yes, you might not want to lead right now online, but you can participate online and then get used to it. And now we have some leaders that did it in per, like as a participant and now they're doing it online. We also had some, um, I mean, I had the ability to pull some of the students. So that we had like um, graduate students interested in this area, helping other older adults uh, that were leaders to help each other. So they were taking care of the technology. They were delivering the exercise piece. And for the participants, uh, we do have like, um, we did send them like a video of all the steps one by one. We have a line uh, so people can call us. Uh, so when 10 a.m. comes and it was the first class of the year, it was like, just like blown out uh, emails and, and phone. And, 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 and it was just like, it's fine. It's 12 weeks. So you have still 11 weeks to figure out. And then if you miss two sessions. So, I mean, uh, we are testing if people became more uh, agile, I guess, technology wise, because I mean, what if the Zoomers was able to force them to go online so they can have that and now they can use more so the technology to make an appointment or to deal with their or meet with their family. So we're testing this as well, because what if the side effect of going online or forced to go online is making them more um, having access to the online environment in the future? 
And I mean, we are focusing a lot of online, but the in-person is still really important. And, and it just became like an option uh, during that time. That's great that you're um, testing new outcomes, uh, considering how important the digital determinants of health are for so many other areas. If um, this program also increases digital literacy, then they're, we're likely to see better outcomes uh, health-wise across the board. So that's really exciting, Danielle. Um, I wanna thank you both for your time on the panel today and for your excellent presentations. We've made it to our first five minute break. Um, so we can all stand up and stretch, uh, grab some water, head to the bathroom if you need it, if you need to. If you do stick around, as we mentioned at the start, our graphic recorder, Rachel, is gonna pop on here to give us a bit of a sneak peek of what she's got for us so far. Great, should I pop on there now? Yes, please. I think we might need to stop the share screen of that cute five minute break. Thank you, okay. If you want to spotlight my phone, I've got the video going now. This is the ch
I'm just taking it down now to get started on um, getting ready for the other ones. Thanks for all the positive feedback, everyone. And yeah, I'm looking forward to getting these in both languages and little reminders of what you're talking about. Such inspiring projects. So thanks for having me here. All right, welcome back everyone. And thanks for sticking with us for today's showcase. We're gonna jump right into our next domain, which is using community approaches to reduce health inequalities. Programs that focus on reducing health inequalities, promote awareness of healthy choices, access to health and social services, or resources for language or cultural minority communities, people living in rural or remote areas and indigenous peoples. Some other examples of HSPP projects examining health inequalities include developing innovative approaches to mitigating the impacts of sensory impairment on social inclusion, or examining new opportunities to support and enable unpaid caregivers who identify as women. Our first presenter, Kate Ellis, is gonna tell us more about the HSPP project, Hearing Equity Through Accessible Research and Solutions. Over to you, Kate. Thanks so much, Candice. So thank you to all of you to, for being here so I can speak a little bit about the Envy Hears project. Um, here we have our investigative team, but I'd also love to do a shout out to our wonderful research team, Danielle and Angie and Gail. You guys are amazing and this project would not be possible without you. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. So why is hearing loss a priority? Uh, so, well, there's a lot of important reasons uh, why someone, uh, why we want to think about hearing loss. Obviously, you can imagine uh, there are communication challenges associated with hearing loss, and those of in and of itself are worth supporting. Uh, but especially in older adults, hearing loss can be a significant contributor to social isolation. And importantly, hearing loss is one of the top modifiable risk factors for dementia if left untreated. And that's a really big deal and not something that's talked about very often. Um, in New Brunswick, I think we all know that we have the highest proportion of older adults in Canada. 
And we know that in New Brunswick, and especially St. John, income disparity is a major source of health inequity, and it has been for quite some time now. And do you want to know a major barrier to getting uh, hearing health support? It's the cost. Um, I'm sure anybody who's worked with older adults has heard that lamentation that uh, the cost of hearing aids is really, really high and a barrier for sure. Uh, so when we think about it, the big picture of improving quality of life and tackling dementia prevention, we have to use all the tools in our belt. If a substantial portion of the population can't afford those tools, though, we have to come up with a better belt, so to speak. So why the HEARS model? Um, simply put, it's evidence-based, it's community-centered, and it's equity-focused, and it was developed with older adults experiencing hearing loss in mind. It was actually developed and researched in Baltimore and then trialed again in Toronto. And in both those jurisdictions, income disparity and health inequity are top of mind. But uh, we have those similarities here in New Brunswick, but we also have a lot more older adults. Uh, so there's a really big, inter or a big need for an intervention like this. So this program is designed for older adults who have mild to moderate hearing loss and for those who may not otherwise be able to access hearing support in their community. For people to be able to participate in the study, they had to have been 60 plus, um, they had to have hearing loss and we did provide them with a hearing test um, and they had to not already be using hearing device. For those who came through this program, we provided a session of communication education uh, to really just help them utilize some strategies that made it easier to hear in different scenarios. We also provided them with an amplification device, and you can see in the picture there, those are the two options that uh, participants could choose from. And just so you guys know, um, amplification devices are not prescription hearing aids, but the ones we used are validated and they work really well. We like to think of them as like reading glasses for your ears. Participants stayed in the program for three, for three months and um, they provided us information on the impact of hearing loss on their life at three different intervals. After they finished the program, they got to keep their device and we hope they continue to use it and that it helps with their quality of life. So not only is this program a source of hearing support for those who may not otherwise be able to afford it or access it, uh, there were some other benefits though that we were a little surprised to find. Uh, we know that another barrier to accessing hearing care can be the stigma associated with age-related hearing loss. Uh, for some people, checking out a new study was less of a leap than going and visiting, visiting an audiologist, um, and we were able to confirm their hearing loss for them, which was much to the delight of many spouses, um, and get them to start thinking about their hearing health, even if they didn't end up participating in the program. Uh, for those who had hearing health issues that were beyond our scope, it was an opportunity for them to get referred to an audiologist or a specialist like an ENT. And for those um, who are experiencing some other um, health effects related to their hearing loss and the pandemic, and of course, mental health is the big one that we think of, um, it was an opportunity to just let them know what some of the other resources in our community were. So next slide, please. Um, so at this point, we've already learned about a lot about this program even before we've done our formal analyses. Um, namely, we know that this is a desperately needed program in New Brunswick, and we know it's feasible. Uh, we're looking to, you know, if we're looking at how we were able to successfully deliver this program in about a year, imagine what it could look like if um, we could do it over a longer period of time and with a bigger geographic scope. In terms of what we're looking to find out about this program once we do our analyses, um, we're looking to see if this program enhances quality of life through improvement of hearing self-efficacy, hearing confidence, and also the social components of hearing loss, which include loneliness, depression symptoms, and perceived social support. We've also taken on some different qual uh, program evaluation measures to get a general feel for how participants experience this program and what it could look like if it's implemented in the long term. So um, that's all I've got and I'll answer any questions during the question period, but thank you so much and feel free to get in touch with myself or the rest of the team if you have any comments, questions or concerns. Thanks so much, Kate. I really enjoyed your analogy of needing a new belt. Um, we're going to pass it over now to Catherine Bijeunesse qui nous parlera du guichet unique de services de soutien communautaire. We'll speak about the um, service to support uh, people to live in their houses. Thank you. I'm presenting part of the program that we have created. This is this window, for, uh, unique window for uh, supporting people to stay at their home the longest possible, especially the elderly who are francophones. We know that our elderly uh, who speak French have uh, 
more difficulties to access to the services than the rest of the population who want to support them as a priority. The project had the objective of creating um, links between the elderly who needed the same um, the, these uh, support. We didn't have necessarily the means to implement this project. We didn't know which project we needed, to, uh, which model we needed to follow. So we created two models, one that was created in first in the US and another one that was created in Quebec. This hybrid system is very, um, it's, it's really adequate to adjust to the different communities. Next slide, please. Merci. The first project, Bien vieillir chez soi cocagne, or Get Old at Home cocagne, we opened our doors in April 21st, 2021. During the last year, we developed our policies and by law, and now we offer services based on a uh, package with volunteers. We offer a, an information line and we help people to understand the different services available in the region. We evaluate the needs of our users and we also uh, call them. We offer uh, um, meal, uh, meals on wheels. Sometimes it's just small repairs that are needed in the house, like uh, the changing the smoke detector or the bulb the light bulbs or removing the snow, and we also offered transportation. We have formed 13 volunteers and we have six users so far, and we have more calls every week for new users. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The evaluation will take place later this year with the volunteers and the users, but so far, what is the thing that makes us successful with this single window or one-stop shop? I think that the most important success factor is to stop working in silos and start, we started working finally together. I'll give you an example with the uh, Meals on Wheels. This concard, it's uh, a place where there were, this service was not available at all. So we worked with two nursing homes where we, where we uh, allowed them to um, deliver these meals to the people who were staying at home with the snowstorms well sometimes people cannot leave their houses because there there's nobody to remove the snow from the doors so we created a partnership with a stakeholder now who's helping us to remove the snow from the entrances of people, elderly people, uh, in order to allow them to get out of their houses. We also work with um, volunteers. We have limited staff or volunteers, therefore we have to be efficient. The community has recognized the importance of this project and they trust the system and the people who will help them. And this awareness we created about the project helped us immensely. This is uh, in a snapshot, this uh, project. I can answer your questions in English or in French. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Congratulations on opening your doors in 2021 despite COVID-19. It's a 
a great achievement. I will start with one question in French, and I can repeat it in English if you'd like. The first question is to find the right balance in the different approaches between systems and personalized solutions. These two initiatives are here to answer to individual needs for the elderly, but also offer solutions for the community. So how do you consider that it would be a good solution or what the solution to put this on scale i will answer in english our, our uh, answer but um i think the approach here was really to see okay what is the envelope of the box and what you put in the box can be very flexible for instance um you need to know what services are available if if we would to implement this this uh, a one stop shop outside of Kokang, uh, I would go through the same process of assessing the services that are available and then simply patching the the hole and the, just what is missing in that community. Uh, you don't copy paste uh, the the model. You you have to uh, make sure that the the maybe the structure is similar, uh, but what you put in uh, the, um, uh, the membership, what, how do you organize the services for what price, for example, can vary, it can change uh, over each community. Uh, and the services that will be missing, like the Meals on Wheels was not available in Kaka, it might be available somewhere else. So it will, it will change a little bit, but based on the need of the community, but the structure can, can change, can stay the same across uh, different communities. Forgot that I muted myself. Knew that would happen at some point. Uh, thank you very much, Kathleen. Kate, do you want me to repeat the question in English? Um, I just want to, I guess, maybe confirm that my understanding was that you were just asking about uh, just kind of some of the learnings between those system level and individual level approaches. Am I That's exactly? Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, I know for us, uh, some of the kind of learnings is when you're kind of doing that balancing act between the system level approaches and the individual level approaches. Um, I think sometimes when we're thinking about what's going to benefit very broadly in a community is, is we have this notion almost of like a silver bullet that's going to fix everything, right? Um, you know, oh, this is the solution. It's going to fix hearing health for everyone. And I think we really need to get a little bit more comfortable with abandoning that notion. Um, because if we're really truly considering that individual level perspective, the 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 fact of the matter is that um, individuals are different. They have different needs. Um, different approaches are going to benefit um, people differently. Um, I know I just said different a lot. Um, so I think, you know, if we're really considering that individual level approach, you have to, yes, you can be evidence-based. Yes, you can use a best practice. But if you're not prepared to pivot um, and adapt to different people's needs, um, that's, that's definitely going to be what is going to make your project uh, unsuccessful and what's going to really ultimately not benefit the community. Um, I think there's also, you kind of have to abandon some of the notions of what your population might be. Um, I know for us coming into this project, because there had already been two iterations of the project in different locations, we kind of had a preconceived notion of what our population might look like. And of course, it, we were surprised to find that there was it was really actually quite a diverse population and there was no kind of one size fits all approach. So I know for us, we had to work, you know, um, and do program delivery. Sometimes it was in community centers. Sometimes it was um, just kind of right on site um, in kind of more of a clinical setting. Um, I know even too, like uh, some people really benefited from like simply one on one approaches where other people needed to come in with. Uh, their group of friends and their support system uh, to gain some benefits. So really just being able to pivot. Um, and I think one of the things that when we're working with older adults that is really going to be important for any kind of system level approach is realize how reliant our system is on caregivers. And that if you're not considering them in your individual level approaches, the system is going to fall apart. That's some really great insight, Kate. Um, I want to, I want to, pick on that a little bit further and, and get you both to, you know, maybe reflect a little bit on, you know, what is the role of unpaid caregivers in both of your projects? Um, and how did you come, how did you get them to the table and what are you doing to support them to stay there? Uh, Catherine, I don't know if you'd like to go first. Yeah, I can, I can probably jump in. Um, 
Well, our program is, doesn't rely on caregivers necessarily. We use caregivers to maybe connect with, with the seniors that, that need help. Uh, but uh, in our case, we are relying on trained uh, volunteers, part of it, um, and other in, in partnership with other communities. So that is true that, that, that uh, caregivers have a, a heavy load of, of, uh, of work to do. And then if we can shift that uh, burden of care and give them a little bit of help with through the uh, uh, initiative like our project and i think will will we'll help people to stay in their home uh, longer not forever that's not the that's not the goal and i don't think it's possible but at least delay uh the the admission to a long-term care facility uh with with supporting the caregiver but also um seniors who live alone for instance i know our experience um you know uh, within the context of our study uh caregivers were often kind of coming in, not necessarily even as a caregiver, but uh, much more so as a communication partner. Um, and so, you know, especially where such a large comp component of our project was on not just providing someone with a device, but teaching them how to use it, teaching them some strategies um, to help them hear better. And some of those strategies really do require the buy-in of the person you're speaking with, right? If you're coming up behind someone who um, is having a hard time hearing and you're talking to the back of their head, they're not going to understand you. Um, you know, if you're attending uh, physician's appointments um, or any kind of healthcare appointment with, uh, with someone you're caring for or are in a relationship with, and I'm sure we've all kind of heard the, the adage of uh, the doctor typing on the computer, turning away while they're talking to you. Um, having another support system there to say, hey, listen, I need you to look at my partner while um, you're speaking to them so they can understand the instructions. So we really found that for people who were able to have a communication partner, it was really, it, it, it was a huge benefit to them, not only to have that support, but to also really implement those strategies and even to simple things like, you know, tech support with their devices. Um, so, I mean, for us supporting those caregivers and those communication partners, it was really, we just tried to be there for them. So, you know, if it was that they needed to call us six or seven times to really just um, help them uh, support their communication partner. That was great if it was having them um, having a couple more face-to-face -face meetings where we could really just go through the process again and really, you know, that those were kind of the supports we tried to provide. Um, the other thing too is acknowledging that it, it, it can take a toll when you're trying to be your, your partner's everything. Um, and so one of the things we tried to do is come prepared with um, little resources of what was available in our community. So, you know what, yes, if you're kind of realizing while we're sitting here talking to you about mental health related to hearing loss that you know what your mental health is taking a whole toll well guess what here's some resources in the community you can access um so that was that was our strategy i'm sure there's um some great uh strategies out there that we could look at applying as well thanks so much to you both i think um you know it's one of the key components of this is really making sure that we feel like we're all in it together and it sounds like them you know that's the approach you're taking with providing those additional supports to so that the care partner can be in it together with the care receiver but also so that the care partner has someone who's there for them too um i see in the chat lots of great comments um people talking about how excited they are for your projects and how helpful your projects have already been to some of their um partners and family members so i think i'm going to leave it there and uh switch us over to the next um panel but thank you both so much for your presentations and for answering those questions thank you so much candace Donc, uh, la prochaine domaine examine l'intégration. The topic is about the integration of the emerging technologies with the social services and the health services to help the aging population. This project can include changes in the building of uh, the houses and also the integration of technology and uh, health care facilities. The two projects we will analyze today, analyze today are the, the first of one is the um, technological platform to evaluate the um, health of the uh, elderly. I will now uh, give you the floor. Great, thanks. So thanks everybody for joining this afternoon. Uh, it's wonderful to see the progress in all these different projects and how a lot of the concepts are straddling across the different areas. So we're getting some consensus. So 
So the project I'm talking about today is called Pitch, uh, specifically the implementation for the HSPP project, we're calling it Wellness Check. And uh, this concept is looking at this, uh, you know, the, the need to change the, pro the healthcare system to be more proactive. So I've got this quote here, we're drowning in an epidemic of chronic disease, it's overwhelming our healthcare system, but fear and loneliness are really some of the worst among those. Um, and there was a recent report by the CDC on the risks of loneliness and social is isolation, and, and they're finding that uh, some of these are associated with increased risks of dementia by 50% and heart disease and all kinds of issues. So we know that we need to change the way that we're delivering healthcare for chronic disease, um, but that we're also managing the social isolation and human elements of this at the same time. And so uh, just as a little bit of a teaser, I guess, on some of the, the things we're seeing, we're seeing quotes here, like when, when you don't know, you worry. So being able to check is comforting and it's comforting to check in regularly and see you're on an even basis, no ups or downs. So there's a really human element uh, to what we're trying to do with this technology. Uh, next slide, please. So, so backing up a little bit, Pitch is an initiative that's been led by Verisource, a software development company here in Fredericton and the University of New Brunswick to try to develop a modular digital health platform that can be used to accommodate the needs of various end users uh, with a focus on increasing engagement and empowering seniors and their circles of care to stay in the community. And so ultimately we're aiming to leverage technology and the data that comes from it to promote real human connections between people uh, and to provide tangible value to the system at the same time. Uh, we're developing this platform outside of the HSPP project um, to offer this digital infrastructure to deploy proactive health monitoring, whether that's health and wellness monitoring for long-term care or out in the community or even in corporate wellness. So the idea is this platform is modular and interpretable so that it can be used by various different populations. Uh, and what it does is it enables the tracking, uh, the sharing of health information among a circle of care uh, and enables sort of data analytics to look at things like anomaly detection and changes in trends and outcomes. Uh, and the purpose of that is to use those data to both modify behaviors on the parts of the seniors, but also to be able to intervene proactively should the, should the, the data notify that. So as part of this HSPP funded project, uh, we've partnered with Kindred Home Care, who's the largest provider of in-home care services in the province. Uh, and really we set out to evaluate the use of this pitch platform in the context of leveraging the fact that caregivers were already going into the home on a regular basis uh, and to understand what the implications are of trying to deploy this technology-based solution uh, to augment and provide more value for these personal support workers moving into the community. So we want to do a few things. We want to understand uh, user acceptance testing and the ability to train these caregivers to use a system like this. We've heard other people saying, you know, the technology can be a challenge. So we want to evaluate that. We want to identify and understand factors that may predict changes in the seniors' ability to stay in the home. We want to improve engagement with those seniors. And afterwards, we want to look at a retrospective analysis to see if we could have predicted from those data anything that might have prevented a, a you know, risk of injury or hospitalization or something like that. So next slide, please. So we've been really excited about the rollout of this so far. Uh, we're now entering our eighth month of uh, more than 100 people being assessed by the pitch platform every week. So this is kindred personal support workers who were going into the home to provide some services around the home, but now the nature of those interactions have been augmented where they've been trained to use this digital health platform and provide regular weekly assessments, things like blood pressure, weight, gait and mobility, cognitive assessment, uh, uh, SF36, which is sort of like quality of life. Um, and we're getting really great feedback from them. First of all, uh, Kindred has done an amazing job training caregivers with this. We've had almost, it was about a 50% response yes rate to one email call out to say, would you like to be involved? So we have 191 uh, caregivers trained as part of uh, the Kindred program all across the province. Here you see in sort of the, the diagrams here. And we currently have 108 people being assessed every single week by those caregivers. Um, and Kindred has developed this training program to facilitate that so that we were able to train up these personal support workers very quickly within a day. And they've been deploying this with no problem. 
Um, we're seeing noted improvement in communication and engagement with seniors. We're getting lots of great quotes about uh, how they're more engaged, how they're paying more attention to their health, and they're really using the information they're getting back as a challenge to improve their health. And we're getting really uh, early anecdotal information from the circle of care, from the healthcare workers that are supporting these individuals to say, you know, one of the best feelings was being thanked by nurses and doctors because they believe the wellness check initiative would be a great motivator in the client's situation. We're looking forward to recruiting more clients and working with them in the future. So we're getting great anecdotal information so far. We're just now entering that phase of the data analytics, um, but, but great results early on in the project. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, we'll hand the floor over to Cody now to tell us about the Polypharmacy app and um, its spread and scale. Thanks, Candace, and thank you everyone else for uh, helping put together this showcase. Uh, my name is Cody Davor. I am a research coordinator at the Center for Innovation and Research in the Aging Population. And today I would like to talk about problematic polypharmacy, or also referred to as medication overload, which as I'm sure many of you know, is a significant issue causing widespread harm, particularly to older adults. Nearly two thirds of community dwelling adults are taking five or more medications, while residents in long-term care homes are frequently prescribed 10 or more. In Canadian nursing homes in 2016, nearly 70% of those residents received a potentially inappropriate medication. And this is problematic because potentially inappropriate medications are associated with adverse drug events and may be of little to no benefit to those who, of who take them. And there's also a growing body of evidence which suggests that patients as well as physicians may not recognize or have difficulty recognizing these adverse drug events from the potentially inappropriate medications, from which this would result in additional medications being prescribed to treat an adverse drug event. Now, one strategy to address these issues is for the physician and or pharmacist to perform regular medication reviews, potentially change, decrease, or even stop medications. However, this process is time consuming, resource intensive, as well as it requires expert knowledge. This is where MedReviewer, which is a polypharmacy poly app powered by MedSafer, comes into play to help manage medication overload and provide deep prescribing opportunities for long-term care residents. Next slide, please. Approximately 1,000 residents will be recruited for the study from five long-term care homes in New Brunswick. These homes will be placed within three clusters, um, cluster one consisting of one long-term care home and clusters two and three, each consisting of two long-term from care homes. The estimated study duration is 18 months, where we will be implementing a step wedge cluster randomized trial, which will begin with three months of baseline data on rates of deprescribing, followed by a new cluster entering the intervention phase every three to four months thereafter. This intervention design, um, it really addresses seasonality and it allows all clusters to participate in the intervention. During the intervention phase, clinicians will actively be using the MedReviewer app to consider if the deeper prescribing opportunities generated make sense for the patients. So essentially the inter long-term care facility assessment, the data taken from that is then exported into the MedReviewer app where the MedSafer software program then cross-references the medication regimen and the medical condition for the residents and produces deep prescribing opportunities with the report presented to the clinicians. Ultimately, the final position is up to the clinician on whether the deep prescribing opportunity is what's best for the patient. And the main outcome of the study that we will be looking at is the proportion of patients with one or more potentially inappropriate medications deep prescribed. So being reduced or stopped or changed um, to a safer alternative in the 90 days following a prescription review. So where we are still in the early stages of the study, we are still in the control phase, there are no deep prescribing results on which we can report on. However, preliminary results from the revised patient's attitudes towards deep prescribing questionnaire indicate that 60% of those who we have interviewed um, at the York Care Center, they are willing and open to stop one or more of their current medications if deemed possible by their physician. Next slide, please. So what's the benefits of MedReviewer? Um, now, the MedReviewer benefits both clinicians as well as long-term care residents. 
For clinicians, it will really help with reducing the time required to identify these potentially inappropriate medications. It'll also provide supporting information for deprescribing and deprescribing opportunities, as well as it enables them to easily access this deprescribing information as needed. For the residents, it will decrease the risk of potentially inappropriate medications and their associated adverse drug events, and as well with the ultimate goal of improving their quality of life. With that, I would like to thank everyone for listening, as well as introduce one of the principal investigators who is with us today, who will be helping out with the questioning. Uh, Carol Goodine is a registered pharmacist and clinical pharmacy manager with Horizon Health in the, in the Fredericton area. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cody. Um, and welcome, Carol, as well. It's nice to see you again. Um, my first question for, um, for you, Carol and Cody, and, and also for Eric, is really about the, the spread and scale component of this. Um, and what I'm wondering is, you know, the seniors that you're currently, um, that you're currently working with are seniors who are, have multiple touch points with the healthcare system. However, we know that, you know, home health monitoring can be beneficial um, and polypharmacy apps or, or being able to identify and, and manage when you're, um, when your medications are overlapping could be beneficial way before you enter a nursing home or um, potentially even before you require home care services. There's plenty of older adults who are still living fairly independently and safely at home. So how do you, how do you foresee or do you foresee a way where these technologies could be used in the community um, beyond uh, through healthcare service delivery? Yeah, I'll jump in onto that one, I guess. So there is a blend across the two of them. Um, certainly one of the things that we wanna look at with the pitch model is how we can do that. So uh, I think Catherine mentioned earlier, there's a balance between us, you know, leveraging unpaid caregivers or in informal caregivers in the community and enabling them, but also not putting more of the burden on them than we necessarily do. So we wanna be careful with that to understand how much can we help reduce the burden on them through efficient delivery of services or sort of allow them to take you know, the lead in the community. So um, at least with the pitch model, we've designed it sort of be intuitive and it's a software workflow that walks you through it. Um, I think the demonstration that the training has been really effective with the personal support workers who had previously you know, no experience running this kind of thing within Kindred suggests that we could find a model that would work to support the, the members in the community as well. Great. Go ahead, Carol. Oh, I, I was say, I don't know if anyone can hear me. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for, for allowing me to speak as well. So I, I think it is, it is exciting. Um, and there is an opportunity to use our application in the community setting. Uh, it wouldn't be specifically for the older adults and their caregivers, but more as the care team. So definitely physicians, nurse practitioners, pharmacists in the community to be able to use this information to identify people that were at risk and then to engage those um, older adults and the rest of their care team in the discussion about which medications are you having trouble with? What are you willing to work with us on to reduce and, and definitely being more proactive and doing that earlier uh, could have significant positive impacts. Thanks, Carol. I see a question here about um, how this project has potentially linked into the Nursing Home Association's appropriate use of antipsychotics collaborative. Can you speak to that at all? So it hasn't, it's it's using the same principles, I guess, as the um, antipsychotic program did. Um, antipsychotics are one of many different potentially inappropriate medications. So antipsychotics really was, was the first group of medications that was targeted by the government of New Brunswick. And that was a great collaboration um, between all of the nursing homes. And that really set the stage for having nursing homes participate in deprescribing and participate in identifying um, people living in the nursing homes that would benefit from a reduction in medications and, and keeping an eye on which ones were really needed the medication and which ones could come off of it. And so with our project, we're expanding on that first group of medications and adding on to it. Um, so we know there are all kinds of other medications that are potentially overused. We know that um, a group of medications, PPIs for, um, for stomach issues are, are often overused and, and we can likely look at 
reducing that in the in the nursing home setting. Um, we know that we need to keep an eye on some of their antihypertensives, so blood pressure medications, medications for diabetes. As as we get older, we need to adjust things because people's bodies changes and and what they need change. So so again, it, I guess the that was a long way of saying it's it's the next logical step, I guess, to um, deprescribing uh, antipsychotics and and now go moving beyond that. Thanks, Carol. Um, both, both of these projects deal with technology and we often hear, and it, you know, maybe it's a myth and you can bust it for us that people might be a little bit hesitant to adopt new technologies, um, whether it's at home or in a healthcare setting. Have you experienced any of that hesitancy in your projects? And if so, how have you dealt with it? You guys want to go first? I was going to say, Eric, I talked, I'll let you. Okay. So, yeah, so, so far, that's one of the things that we really wanted to test was understand how this would work, because, you know, as, as an engineer, I'm coming at this from that data technology perspective. And so people assume a lot of the time that we're going to sort of force technology on them. Uh, but we've really flipped that model and we've been trying to understand how can we use this platform in a way that is accessible to everybody else. So we've had really good response. We have learned some amazing things throughout. For example, you know, when a user creates a new account, don't make a complicated first password because it's a little bit harder for some people to understand how to translate that across to a new password. Um, but in terms of the use of the technologies, the, these technologies are available today and they've gotten to the point where they're for, fairly straightforward. So it's facilitating that workflow and the habits around it that provide the value. So for example, if you're going to then collect that data over time, uh, people start to understand how they can interpret those changes. So they can absorb the information as, as low tech or as high tech as they want to go, I think. And Candace, I don't think we're really at a stage in our project yet where we've had those experiences. Thanks, Carol. So, yeah, that'll, that'll be something that we kind of come back to more so towards the tail end of the project and, uh, you know, really communicating with those who, who use the app and, and what their experience was like and uh, going forward, what changes can be made. Right. I see a, a pretty specific question here for you guys, um, Carol and Cody. Uh, Keith is asking, how is duplication of medication review avoided um, by the MD slash PharmD and um, what's the false positive rate in standard care practice? So that's a really great question. And that's something that's been brought up by our physicians. And at this point in time, our application, um, they don't have a way to, to reduce um, overlap between the two medication reviews. So really at this point in time, it's a tool to identify the, the problems and we'll still need to investigate and learn more about the processes of how to actually use it in practice. Thanks, Carol. I see um, Aaron mentioning that technology uptake slash digital resistance and literacy is gonna be a huge learning from HSPP. I think something across many projects that we'll have to be thinking about and also um, thinking about how we communicate to other people working in the age tech space. Um, thank you both, uh, all three of you actually, for your time and for participating on this panel. I'm going to um, move along to the last theme of our uh, showcase today, which is developing innovative care pathways. Um, Innovative delivery of health and social support services through improved care pathways is, um, is, is a really critical component of the five themes and, and, and interrelates with all of the other um, domains of HSPP really well. The projects in this domain focus on increasing seniors and their families' awareness of programs and services so that we can better direct them to the appropriate supports and level of care. Uh, the two projects that we're going to be hearing from today are Stroke Navigation New Brunswick and the Innovative Community Partnered Pulmonary Rehab for Seniors in New Brunswick. So Beverly, I'm going to ask you to get us started by telling us more about your proof of concept initiative. 
Thanks, Candice. So my name is Beverly Kemp, and I've been leading our stroke navigation project in New Brunswick um, through the Heart and Stroke Foundation of New Brunswick, of course. And I want to set the stage here with a quote from our director of stroke nationally in Canada, uh, Heart and Stroke Canada. And she said that more people are surviving stroke, which is cause to celebrate. Acute care for stroke patients has improved dramatically, but unfortunately, the rest of the system has not kept pace. There are gaps in rehabilitation and community services. And so that's really where stroke navigation comes in is our intention is to fill some of the gaps that exist in New Brunswick around community services. And so if you can go to the next slide. So who are we working with? We are working with individuals in New Brunswick who have had a stroke and have been discharged from the hospital back to the community. So specifically for research purposes, we're working with seniors who are 65 plus. And what are we doing? We are offering a community-based program called stroke navigation, which is a service that individuals who've had a stroke can access, um, and they're able to access a designated person in the community called a stroke navigator who is able to help them with everything and anything related to their stroke recovery journey. So they do everything from providing education around, you know, what is a stroke? Um, what are the effects that I'm experiencing now? How do I prevent a secondary stroke? They support recovery plans and they help their clients to navigate towards their goals. They provide resources for managing stroke. They connect individuals to relevant services. So whether that be other community-based services or clinical services where appropriate, and they offer strategies to navigate the healthcare system and also the social system. So things like how do you be a self-advocate? Um, this is your healthcare team. This is what it looks like. These are the right people to be directing these questions to. Uh, you know, this is the process for getting your driver's license back. This is how you apply for disability supports. All those things that come up with having a stroke um, that oftentimes there's a lot of questions around having that one consistent person in the community um, that is able to answer those. And so why are we doing this? At the end of the day, about 70% of people who have a stroke are discharged back to the community. But stroke is, it's an overnight event. It doesn't happen gradually. For most people, it happens very suddenly and they're not prepared. They don't have the know-how, the skills, or the resources in place to know how to manage their condition or to know what to expect. And so having somebody in the community who is a designated person that they can turn to to ask those questions to and to navigate them through their journey is designated in our national best practices and prior to this program um, was a gap in services in New Brunswick. And so that's what we're hoping to fill. So if we go to the next slide, what are the overall outcomes that we're hoping to achieve? So some of the driving statistics right now behind this program are that one in four people who have a stroke will have another stroke and up to 80% of strokes are preventable. So oftentimes through things like better self-management, knowledge around lifestyle changes, um, those sorts of pieces. And so Again, having a stroke is an overnight event. Oftentimes people are not equipped with the skills and the resources and the know-how around self-management. And so it's about providing both the person who had the stroke and their caregiver, those skills, resources, and know-how so that they can better self-manage their recovery. They can better comply with their healthcare plans, which leads to you know, a better recovery in general, better quality of life. And at the end of the day, ideally um, a reduction in rehospitalization rates and complications from having a stroke. And so on the right hand side, you can see two quotes to show that we are trending in that direction. We are still at the very early um, data collection phases of this project, but there have been other stroke navigation projects that have happened across Canada and across other OEC countries that have seen those goals met. And so we're really hopeful that uh, we're trending in the right direction and that those are the types of outcomes that we'll see. So that's it for me, I'll pass it on to John. Thanks, Beverly. John, over to you. Do we have John Doucette here? Um, if so, your mic's not on. He is here. I see the video. I think he's just trying to get it working. Yeah, I can see that he's um, he's live. We just can't hear him.
John, you're unmuted. You might want to try not using your headphones, perhaps. In the meantime, while we um, wait for John's audio to work, uh, feel free to let us know in the chat if there's anything specific you've learned today from one of these presentations that you are excited about or um, if you were surprised about something. John, would you like to try leaving the meeting and then coming back in again? And in the meantime, Candace, maybe um, we can show Rachel Dara, our graphic designer again. Graphic yeah, that sounds recorder. great. Rachel, I'll just pop you up. And I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, great. Thank you. So I've got, yeah, still in progress here, but can you see, or I think if you spotlight me there, then I'll, oh, there we go. Okay. So, Yeah, so still in progress there, but underway. Thanks very much, Rachel. It's looking great. And I think um, everyone in the audience has been really excited about your uh, your visuals and really excited to receive them. Well, that's, I appreciate that so much. Yeah, I hope it helps uh, people remember some of the different parts and uh, learning from each other's work. I see lots of great comments in the chat box about things that people have learned about the impacts of small changes. Um, you know, how are we going to work together after, after HSPP or how do we help sustain the projects that come out of HSPP? Um, let's check back with John now and see if he is able to hear us and speak to us. Okay, can you folks hear me now? We can. Oh, perfect. Yeah, my browser, for some reason, had decided it wasn't going to allow me to connect <laughs> with the program. So, okay. So, I want to thank everyone for giving us the opportunity to speak to you about the uh, innovative and community partnered pulmonary rehab for seniors in the province of New Brunswick. And as you can see on this slide here, we have Paulette, one of our former participants, who is a New Brunswick senior living with COPD. Now, prior to attending our program, Paulette was, told us that she was actually preparing to sell her home, 
because she was no longer able to get to her bedroom on the next floor, the flight of stairs was simply creating too much of an obstacle for her. But by the time she completed the program, not only was she able to get to the top of those stairs and get to her bedroom without feeling short of breath, that she actually decided to hold on to her house and not sell her family home. And, you know, Paulette's story is just one of the many, many successful stories we've had with our program. And Paulette is actually one of the 30,000 New Brunswick seniors currently living with COPD. In 2016, COPD was actually identified as the second leading cause for admissions in New Brunswick hospitals with an associated cost or healthcare system of around $23 million. It has been estimated that by the end of this decade, the cost for COPD to the Canadian healthcare system will be close to $10 billion. So the costs for COPD across the country are rising all the time. Interestingly enough, this past winter, the New Brunswick Health Council actually revealed for the first time in decades that the life expectancy for New Brunswickers was declining when compared to the national average. And guess what? They identified COPD as the highest contributing factor to the increase in avoidable premature deaths in New Brunswick. So we know prevention is the key and premature death from COPD is preventable and pulmonary rehabilitation can help accomplish this task. A few years ago, the Canadian Thoracic Society released a position statement in which they identified pulmonary rehab as the single most neglected non-pharmacological approach and tool that we have for treating COPD. And they also indicated that of the 2.5 million Canadians living with COPD in the country, less than 0.4% of those individuals had access to PR. So accessibility is a huge issue with, with pulmonary rehab in Canada. Next slide, please. So pulmonary rehabilitation is an education and exercise-based program that is designed to improve the quality of life for individuals living with COPD. It gives them the tools necessary to regain control of their lives. And by that, we mean is that the individuals are arriving to the pulmonary rehab program with telling us that COPD is controlling their lives. By the time they complete the program, we've given them the ability now to regain control over COPD. Our participants will get three We'll spend three sessions per week, two hour sessions over an eight week period, either in the morning or afternoon, it's their choice. And this is all based in a community based setting. The program is staffed by senior healthcare students from a variety of healthcare programs. And they work with the uh, participants by providing them with the education necessary for them to understand the disease process. And after the education sessions, they get together with the participants and they uh, participate in low impact exercises that are really designed to improve their overall stamina and give them a little extra strength. Now, our program is unique in the sense that it is infused with healthcare students. So we're not actually pulling our limited staffing resources that, that the pandemic has, has already maxed to the, to the maximum here. Um, and we are located outside of an acute care facility. So we're pulling this out of the hospital environment, putting it in the community and improving access to, to the area for our seniors. From the onset, this program was actually designed to tear down the barriers, the traditional barriers associated with PR in Canada, and provide New Brunswick seniors living with COPD greater access to PR. Next slide. So following completion of our PR program, our participants have actually noted an overall improvement in their quality of life and their activity for daily living, with one participant actually telling us that they've done more things uh, after this program than they've done in the last 10 years. Our participants have become more socially engaged. Uh, how this has improved their mental health status because now they're finally realizing they're not, no longer alone with this. One participant actually indicated, feels like I have a brand new family. So we're hoping with pulmonary rehabilitation access, we're gonna reduce emergency room visits, admissions, and the length of stay with visits. And you know, we know PR works. We wanna simply make it much more accessible to New Brunswick seniors living with COPD. And hopefully uh, we're gonna give our New Brunswick seniors living with COPD a little bit of hope. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, I'm glad that we got to hear the presentation. We've <laughs> Thank resolved you. all our tech issues. Um, I do want to bring um, Beverly back and ask you both. We've you've talked about navigation. You've talked about service accessibility. Um, 
what can we be doing better to make sure that older adults in New Brunswick have um, are, are aware and have the services accessible to them? What needs to change at a systemic level? I can go first. Um, you know, I think we have recently been doing a really good job with some new tools in place like 2 and one and Senior Support NB, which gives a really great jumping off platform for um, looking at some of the available resources in their community. I think the beauty with some of the projects like John's Pulmonary Rehab Project and Stroke Navigation is then funneling down and we have these centers of excellences too around specific um, conditions that seniors are facing so that they have this wider depth of knowledge and can um, you know, navigate these seniors to appropriate resources for that condition as well. Um, and then I also think going back to, you know, having a community of practice and working with coll in collaboration with other services and doing our part as stakeholders as well and engaging with other communities and um, sessions like today are a really good start to that as well. I know I've learned about so many other really great projects going on that we'll definitely be connecting with um, in the future. Yes, with regards to uh, pulmonary rehabilitation, one thing we have to realize is that access is, is crucial. And one of the areas that the Canadian Thoracic Society identified was there simply weren't enough referrals. Referral to PR was very limited in Canada, limited to pulm pulmonary specialists, which we know we have a shortage of in, in the country. So one of the goals is to, is to increase the ability of healthcare professionals to refer uh, New Brunswick seniors living with COPD to a pulmonary program. Uh, we also would like to, to find a way if we could create a website in which our clients could actually easily access a list of conditions by simply entering a word into a search bar that would provide them with a list of services within their area that they could easily access and provide them with information on how to access those services, a key person that they can connect with. Uh, you know, in a perfect world, it would be great if uh, within their own family physician's office that they could have a staff member show them how to navigate to that website and make, make access ex accessible. Um, you know, we're dealing with individuals who may not be as tech savvy as we want them to be. They may be limited for travel resources. We've seen this in pulmonary rehabilitation that one of the biggest barriers is, is physically accessing uh, the location of a PR program, whether it's it's through vehicles or public transportation, and we've got to reduce those barriers. We, those are barriers that are currently existing in the country, and we can't have this. Thank you both. Um, John, somebody asked in the audience, has COPD been on the rise as well, or are rates stable in relation to your comment about um, rise in, in preventable deaths? So that's a great question. I'm glad that that was asked because COPD is, is definitely on the rise, and one of the reasons for this is that it's being diagnosed more, more, uh, e more effectively, I should say. Uh, in the past, most individuals would not go see a physician uh, with issues with breathing until they were at what we would call a moderate COPD stage. So the mild COPD patients are being missed. Uh, they're just they're just chalking up to I'm getting older and I'm getting heavier and that's why I'm having trouble breathing. And uh, so by the time they were showing up, they were already in an advanced moderate to severe stage. And all of a sudden they were they were putting a lot more emphasis on uh, healthcare services. They were being admitted more frequently. And if we if we can catch uh, our, 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 our individuals earlier, we can so hopefully prevent this. And another area that really um, is starting to show us that we were missing a large population group was that uh, females suffering, uh, living with COPD were not being diagnosed as fast as males were, were uh, being diagnosed. So we're seeing an increase in the amount of women that are being diagnosed with uh, COPD. And again, this is, this is just showing us that we were missing this large group here. Thanks, John. I want to ask all our um, presenters to turn your videos back on and join us for a kind of final panel question. Um, we've heard lots today about how um, how excited we, we were to hear about other projects, um, people that were looking forward to connecting, reaching out to the importance of the collective impact of HSPP projects. And so I'd like to ask all our presenters, who are you most excited about working with um, moving forward and, um, you know, who do you want to connect with? Who do you want to bring on as a new partner? And I'll, I'll start with you, Beverly, because um, we're wrapping up here. We'll go backwards um, with our speakers. Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think it's it's hard to choose because, you know, when we're looking at people who have a stroke, there's such a wide range of effects that you can experience from having a stroke. And so I think it's really dependent on the individual and going back to 
Kate's point much earlier is that it's not a one size fits all approach. It's about um, really making sure that it is an individual, um, like that asset based approach and doing what works best for the individual. I do really think that the Zoomers on the Go project is really fascinating. And I think we have referred some of our clients there in the past, but um, you know, seeing the impacts of that will probably continue to refer people um, in the future. Thanks, Beverly. John, what, what are your thoughts? Who are you most excited to work with? Um, uh, you know what? I think I, I would identify every member of, the, of this, uh, this showcase as potential uh, collaborators because every one of you are going to come across a New Brunswick senior who could potentially be living with COPD. And it's, it, they would definitely benefit from, from spending time with us. So really, um, I'm putting the feelers out there right now. If you, if you come across a New Brunswick senior who is living with COPD, um, it's an easy question to say. Have, have you ever considered going to a pulmonary rehabilitation program to see if we can improve your overall quality of life and, and reduce your, your dependency on, on having to run to the hospital every single time um, and exposing yourself to, to potential infections? Eric, what about you? I've seen lots of people tagging you in the chat. Yeah, so this is great. Uh, um, I'm a serial collaborator, so I, I echo John's comments. I'd like to work with everybody on this. Um, you know, specific to the pitch piece, uh, the whole goal is that it's a modular platform. And so the toolkits that we use as part of an evaluation are very flexible. So for example, if we wanted to tailor this as a pl digital platform, as the digital infrastructure to do a COPD intervention, we could just create that COPD toolkit and facilitate that sort of in the community assessment or, or cardiovascular disease or, or, or anything really. Uh, so we really are open to engaging with anybody. We, we have a, a project application in with your care center to look at deploying across multiple levels of care. Uh, so we're really inviting any and all people who, who are interested. I'd love to have that conversation. Thanks, Candice. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Cody and Carol, any thoughts on um, other partners you want to bring to the table? There we go. The video works better when you remove the little thing out of the way of the camera. Um, no, uh, I guess off the top of my head, I can't really think of anyone else really necessarily to collaborate with. Um, I'm just kind of in awe uh, listening to all the presentations and, you know, just imagining what everyone has had to go through with COVID and the obstacles that everyone has overcome. Uh, so just kind of round of applause to, to everyone on, on that sense. Carol, did you want to add anything? Well, I, I would echo earlier statements that, you know, I think we'd be open to collaborating with anyone that wanted to work with us. Uh, I think there's lots of opportunity in to learn from different people who are using technology and also, you know, um, improve all of the projects by collaborating, uh, you know, amongst each other. Absolutely. Um, Kate, what about you? Um, well, joining on the bandwagon and echoing everyone, I, I mean, I don't think there's a single person on this call that I wouldn't love to collaborate with. Um, and in fact, we've had the pleasure of collaborating with uh, some of these individuals or are currently collaborating with some of these individuals. Um, I know for the HEROES project, I mean, our kind of um, big vision is that we'd love to implement it as a permanent um, fixture in New Brunswick. And so, I mean, we'd love to get um, some collaboration started with maybe even some government stakeholders who can kind of put some permanence behind it. We'd love to get involved with um, some community groups who can really um, be that, that kind of uh, connection to the community. And especially to like, you know, I think about Zoomers on the Go, which has done such an amazing job of integrating itself into multiple New Brunswick communities for such a long period of time. Like, I think those are some really fantastic, um, uh, some really fantastic skills that we'd love to implement here for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's so much potential. And one of the things I would love to see from all of these HSPP projects together is is really that examination of collective impact because there's so many challenges that we, we there's so many parallels between what we've seen across the board. And I think it's gonna be important to, to be able to see what collectively we can do together. Thanks, Kate, that's uh, that's great thoughts. So many people to learn from. Um, Catherine, je vais pas, passer la parole à toi. Oui, merci. Catherine, I will give her the floor, thank you. Thank you. 
there's so many programs out there that uh, I was even unaware of, and we could naturally like tie in in our in our one stop shop. Um, and that is is exactly why the one stop shop is there is like to connect people with other people. Um, I, I just hope that our projects, when the funding is finished, that if we start collaborating all together and all our project kind of collapse because there's no uh, financial support from to go further, we can find more more grants and everything, but uh, if we could have opened a conversation about uh, how we can sustain those projects on the long term and see which the which one are maybe the most efficient for sure, but that is um, uh, we get we get a lot of excitement among seniors and 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 that those projects are really interested, but they they just okay, but when you're done with your funding, is this this thing stopping or you keep going and we surely try to do as best as we can to make that permanent. Uh, so absolutely collaborating, but also thinking of the future, what we're gonna address, how we can do that. The sustainability piece is absolutely key, Catherine. Um, Danielle. Not to say the same thing as everyone else, but I did send like, uh, Catherine, your uh, contact information to my staff <laughs> while you were talking. Uh, funny enough, like I'm Francophone, but I haven't, I'm having trouble to implement uh, Zoomers in Francophone area. And, and we are ha we're having like surveys opening uh, to like figure out like what are the barriers. Um, but there, that's a challenge um, for the language piece. And I mean, I'm in a favored position because I'm, I am bilingual, but my staff is not. So uh, that's a, a, a struggle or a challenge. Um, but for collaboration, I did put that in the chat at some point uh, to make this all of your and all of our uh, project being sustainable, we need to find key partners that do the same. So if you have a COPD uh, program, find a partner that their goal is, is around COPD, so they will fund it because you do half of their job. If you, we do what they need to do, then they're more than happy to collaborate because you do most of what they need to do. Um, I find that that's the only way we can go financially anyway to help out uh, with those programs to go further is you need to find a key partner that didn't know that you're existing and you are actually meeting his or her um, current, um, I guess, uh, outcome that they need to go for anyway. So like it, it's a win-win it's a situation because we, we often come across people thinking that we want them to pay for something that didn't, they don't have money for. But if you find somebody that has money for what you're doing already, then it will work uh, over the long term. That's that's what I, I get. It's not easy to get to, to, to do, but that's my thinking in terms of financially need. Because the last thing I want to see is seniors in the province saying like, that was great until 2023 happened. Hopefully we can uh, we can figure that out already. And, and then most of you said that Zoomers is great because we were uh, able to push it out. But now I tell my staff, stop pushing out and stop do, uh, start doing well. Because uh, if we don't have a good organization before that goes, that 2023, then there's no point of having people exercising for three years. We need to exercise for 23 years, <laughs> at least. Thanks for um, the insight, Danielle, on financial sustainability and, um, and some partnership ideas as well. Uh, Suzanne, do you wanna jump in next? Yes, I was just going to write a note so I didn't forget, but I was just going to say sustainability is an ongoing process that we have to think about as we move forward in our in all of our projects. Um, but of course, uh, to come back to the original question that you asked, uh, Candice, uh, you know, having seniors aging in place, I see a fit with all the projects. <laughs> um, I could have seniors uh, in my project who would benefit from Zoomers as much as uh, a program on COPD or hearing or I mean be it all of them that have presented and uh, I was sitting here listening to all of the projects being presented and I was telling myself this could almost be we could put all of these pieces together and have one big project <laughs> that really incorporates all of these results and all of these initiatives and uh, it's so wonderful to hear and this this is only part of the projects that have been funded and uh, we're already all excited so I'm really looking forward to the next, uh, the next pieces of uh, the showcase at one point and uh, hearing more, but thank you. It's great that this has been such a great opportunity for people to already identify contacts for, for the clients that you're working with. Um, 
Sharon, I'm going to give you the last word uh, on <laughs> partnerships. Well, I, I can't help but listen and watch all of you today and see that uh, there's so many young people. And um, from a person who is a senior myself, looking to young people who are so involved and so interested, um, thank you. Thank all of you for all of your ideas. And for sure, please always reach out and think about it. If you're trying to do a job on your own and you need some way of sharing that information around, think about young people and bring uh, even younger people than the ones that are on the screen today and bring them in to help you out with whatever it happens to be. But uh, I work across Canada with healthcare and I have to say that all of the issues that have been brought up today are very apropos right across the country. And uh, I think that it would be really incumbent upon us to make sure that we share what we found out because other people, I think there's a lot of creativity that's come through today. And, and I appreciate that as a senior and as a Canadian. So thank you. Thank you, Sharon. I think I did see quite a number of people um, mentioned in the chat at the beginning that they were joining us from all over the country, which was really exciting. Um, our showcase is coming to a close and I want to thank everyone for joining us today and for contributing to the conversation on the future of healthy aging in New Brunswick. I also want to give a special thanks to all of our panelists, um, Suzanne, Sharon, Anita, Danielle, Kate, Catherine, Eric, um, Cody and Carol, Beverly and John. You shared with us some really exciting and inspiring work um, and I think everyone here is looking forward to hearing more about your projects as you go through them. In the coming weeks, MEC2 will be sending out post-meeting materials, including the visual being prepared by Rachel Dara. I know lots of people have asked about that in the chat. You will be receiving English and French versions of it uh, in the next few weeks. So please look out for those materials and don't forget to fill out the evaluation form uh, that'll be sent out right after the showcase to identify areas where we can improve for the next event. If we didn't get to your question today, or if you would like more information, please feel free to get in touch with the presenters using the emails provided in the meeting materials or with the team at MAC2 directly using the email above. Thank you all so much for joining us. Merci encore à tous and have a great rest of your day.